In this video, I am going to concentrate on the definition of tragedy given by Aristotle. We will break that up and try to understand what Aristotle means. When you hear about a railway accident, do you call it a tragedy? When you hear that somebody's grandfather died of old age, do you call that a tragedy? Now, if you are a student of literature, you should be very careful of what you call a tragedy. After this lecture is over, I am sure you will be able to understand what tragedy is and when we should use this word. This is Monami Mukherjee and you are watching Nibble Pop. Just like any other literary term, tragedy is also a very standardized term, which means that there is a standard definition of tragedy and usually students of literature prefer to stick to the definition given by Aristotle. Now who was Aristotle? Aristotle was a Greek philosopher and he observed the qualities of tragedies written in Greek language before his time. Now there are three important figures or tragedians of uh, Greek language who are Sophocles, Euripides and Aeschylus. Now so far as Aristotle is concerned, he based his definition of tragedy on the works by Sophocles. In our subsequent lectures, we will be talking about uh, Greek theatre in detail or uh, about uh, these playwrights in details. But now in this video, I am going to concentrate on the definition of tragedy given by Aristotle. So before anything else, let us look at the definition itself. The standard translation which I have uh, given here, you can see it alongside. Tragedy is an imitation of an action that is serious, complete and of a certain magnitude. In language embellished with each kind of artistic ornament, the several kinds being found in separate parts of the play in the form of action, not of narrative, with incidents arousing pity and fear wherewith to accomplish its catharsis of such emotions. That's a tall one, that's a long, long definition. We will break that up and try to understand what Aristotle means by his definition. So the very beginning he says, tragedy is an imitation of an action. We'll pause there, we will look at this part. Imitation of an action, which means that tragedy is not just any incident of sad result. Tragedy is primarily an imitation, not of any character, not of any story, but of an action. Which means that there are actions in our lives which we perform, which are sometimes very important for us and sometimes they are not that important. Tragedy focuses on imitation of that kind of action which is serious, which has some value. Then complete and of a certain magnitude. Magnitude means length. So if you are going to look at a particular type of drama which is very short, you cannot define it as a tragedy. In order to be classified as a tragedy, it should have a certain length. We will come to those uh, details uh, later. So tragedy is imitation of an action. So on the stage you are performing in imitation of something which happens in real life. So it cannot be something which never happens in life. All right, so it has to be realistic in that sense and then it should Concentrate on something very serious and of certain length. Something happens on the stage and it takes time to happen. In language embellished, embellished means decorated. In language which is decorated. So the language on stage spoken by the characters on stage, uh, they of course they are imitation of real language. 
because they are again taken in they are enacting incidents taken from real life but they should have something ornamental about it so that when you are watching a drama watching a play then you feel like you are gaining something out of it so it should be in some decorated language according to aristotle we are today focusing only on aristotle remember embellished with each kind of artistic ornament the several kinds being found in separate parts of the play so the play would be divided into different parts and these artistic ornaments of language will be visible in all the parts so it's not like in the first part of the play you have an extremely wonderful artistic expression and then in the third part of the play or the last part of the play you have the style fall down no the style should be consistent and that consistency should give out an expression of artistry all right in the form of action not of narrative what is a narrative now i want you to remember two terms one is digesis and one is mimesis uh, in some of my earlier videos i had talked about them but i'll just repeat that once again mimesis is when you present something in front of an audience and there is a performance involved so you are enacting something you are acting out something all right like a king is killed or uh, somebody falls in love with someone so that is shown in front of you so that is mimesis it comes from the word mime mime means you know to enact to show through expressions so mimesis means the imitation which is presented in front of you all right what is digesis digesis or digetic text means where somebody is telling you a story so digesis is narrative where a story is told for example when you take up uh, the instances of novels and short stories you see that somebody is speaking to you that may be the author or some narrator is other than the author but you have someone tell you things that this happened then this happened then this happened in a narrative but in mimesis which you find in theater which you find in movies there everything is shown to you which means that in case of a mimesis you are supposed to make meaning out of those actions you are supposed to be the interpreter you will make sense of what is happening on stage okay uh, so here uh, a greater involvement of the audience is presupposed in case of mimesis here he makes this very clear in the form of action not of narrative so it is a mimesis not digesis with incidents arousing pity and fear so earlier he has mentioned the word serious now he is further defining that word serious by saying that these incidents which are shown on stage in a tragedy they arouse pity and fear what is pity pity is when you look at a character on stage and you feel sorry for that character that oh oh this man he suffered so much that is pity what is fear fear is when you see that a man on stage is suffering and that suffering can be a part of your life too that you could be in that situation too so that is fear you are scared of misfortunes because misfortunes happen to everybody okay so pity and fear these are the two emotions which a tragedy evokes in the audience and then it doesn't let it you know just hang in there mid air it leads to something while watching that tragedy you get to feel emotions like pity and fear and then what happens wherewith to accomplish its catharsis of such emotions that you feel pity and fear but eventually when that tragedy ends when that play ends then you realize that 
you have felt all these emotions but eventually you are feeling peaceful like those emotions are taken out of your system it's like you go to the gym and you run on the treadmill for 30 minutes and your heart is racing but that is not the objective the objective is what happens after that treadmill exercise what happens after you do those push-ups when your body relaxes after a workout then you seem to kind of relax into a stage of peacefulness okay so that state of peacefulness that state of poise is through a catharsis so catharsis is the process through which you get relieved of your pity and fear so a proper tragedy is not something which leaves you weeping and crying and feeling sad about things a proper tragedy is something where you weep and cry and feel sad but when you come out of the theater when you come out of that you know, movie hall you are experiencing a kind of tranquility peace in you so that is the end that is the accomplishment of a tragedy which aristotle prioritizes i'll go back to the question which i asked you in the beginning of this video when there is a railway accident then it is a very it's a very unfortunate incident and of course people's lives are destroyed but that incident does not leave you with that kind of tranquility because there is no catharsis plus there is also absence of something which i will be explaining in the next video so you have to wait for that but for now know this that any incident which does not involve human action cannot be actually called a tragedy which means that if that train accident is something very fatal is just unfortunate nothing more than that then you cannot call it a tragedy which brings us to aristotle's priority on plot when aristotle talks about plot he says that a play has two things two elements one is plot and one is character what is a plot plot is arrangement of events something happens then something happens so the sequence of events and the plot is not always linear it does not always follow a straight line a play can begin in the middle of action then it will talk in flashbacks and tell you of what happened earlier and then it will go on to future so a plot does not always follow a straight line that is the artistry of the dramatist he arranges it in sequences okay and that is the backbone of the play not the characters because characters are simply human beings who act in a certain way what makes a tragedy tragedy is the sequence in which they act which lead to that tragic end to understand plot it will be better if we imagine um you know a pyramid okay the shape of a pyramid in the pyramid you have a base then you have a rising slope then you have a top a falling slope and then another base so that is the structure of a pyramid in the pyramid there are then five points so far as aristotle's idea of tragedy is concerned the plot of a tragedy is also divided into these five points or you can say the five acts which we see in the plays what happens in the tragedy how is the tragedy structured so the first part or the base of the pyramid is called exposition where uh, expose means to bring to light so the characters are introduced to you who the main character is and often they are introduced through other secondary characters chorus okay so you get to know the characters and 
a basic storyline uh, the beginning point and the situation or the setting you get to know all that in the exposition then in the second part you have the rising action okay so that rising action is basically giving you additional information okay which means that there is a storyline and things are added to that storyline often flashbacks are used in this rising action part complications are there okay some extra uh, elements are brought in okay so rising action is the second act of a play you can say which leads to the third act and uh, the climax of the play now often you have this misconception that climax means the last scene of the play no its climax is the highest point of a play which will not come at the end but at the middle of the play or the middle of the plot so the pyramid is rising till the audience anticipation is building they are expecting things to happen and something happens now after that climax if it is a tragedy then what happens the hero or the central character was expecting something to happen but was rising action the climax comes but then he sees that whatever i have expected have actually turned around and i haven't got what i was aiming for so he or she then begins to have what we can call a reversal it is also called peripety which means turning back or reversing so after that climactic point the action comes tumbling down following the other part you know just opposite to rising action which is also called falling action gradually by and by the hero realizes that something has gone terribly wrong and he reaches a point or she reaches a point where that realization strikes really hard that okay this was my mistake that's why everything has come in the opposite direction so it's a realization of a mistake which that person has done and after that mistake comes the point where the drama eventually reaches the other base you know the end base you can say or resolution or denouement and when that play reaches that level of resolution then that catharsis happens in the audience so catharsis is not the evocation of pity and fear catharsis is not when you are feeling pitiful you are feeling afraid no catharsis is when you are getting rid of those emotions you know it's like catharsis comes from a it's a medical term and uh, in the classical periods what happened that um, doctors used to treat by uh, cutting uh, some particular veins in the body of the patients to relieve them of their symptoms so catharsis is like that you know you're cutting yourself up your your heart and you're feeling all those emotions and then that blood is coming out is like those emotions are purged out of your system that that toxin is taken out of your system okay so you feel pity you feel fear after the climax because by that time you have started to like this hero okay and you are feeling sympathetic towards him and looking at his misfortune looking at his reversal of fortune you feel that okay this man deserves better oh i feel so sorry for him or you feel that okay uh, if he could fall then anything would happen to us so that kind of emotions are triggered in you but eventually when the resolution part comes you get that feeling of tranquility that life must go on that kind of a of a of a peacefulness and that moment is the moment of catharsis okay so we will be talking in detail on who is a tragic hero and what are his qualities i'm using his just as a generic pronoun even she uh, and he are uh, same here in this case so what are the qualities of a tragic hero what is the actual meaning of hamartia and how it is different from hubris 
we will also be talking about catharsis in much more detail but today know this that your understanding of tragedy should focus on two things whether an incident has any element of human action or choice or not if an incident or if an event is caused by a mistake on the part of the central character then you can call it tragic if it is just misfortune or unfortunate or a sad event it cannot be a tragedy and second is it should have a substantial size it should have a structure a pyramidal structure if you are to call it tragedy as per the definition of aristotle so today we had learned what aristotle's definition of tragedy is and i'm sure in the subsequent classes you will have all your other doubts cleared if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel do so immediately so that you don't miss any of the lectures because these are very important not just for your first semester but also for your fifth semester dse if you are opting for english honors under any university affiliated to ugc okay so i hope to see you all very soon again till then stay happy bye bye